Hi everyone, this is the PowerPoint lecture on bipolar and related disorders. Um, bipolar disorder, also known as manic depressive illness, is a brain disorder that causes unusual shifts in mood, energy, activity levels, and the ability to carry out day-to-day -day tasks. Symptoms of bipolar disorder are severe. They are different from the normal ups and downs that everyone goes through from time to time. Bipolar disorder symptoms can result in damaged relationships, poor job or school performance, and even suicide. But bipolar disorder can be treated, and people with this illness can lead full and productive lives. So before we get into bipolar disorders, um, I wanted to talk for a couple minutes about delusions and hallucinations. This will be the first time that we are going to start discussing delusions and hallucinations and their role within um, DSM-5 criteria for specific uh, mental illness. We will talk about them a lot when we get to the um, topic of schizophrenia, but um, delusions in particular are going to be introduced um, to you through um, the lens of bipolar disorder. So here are the definitions. The definitions can also be, find, be found in your DSM on page 87. So delusions are fixed beliefs that are not amenable to change in light of conflicting evidence. So their content may include a variety of themes, and I'm going to go through each of these themes quickly with you. So persecutory delusions um, is the belief that one is going to be harmed or harassed by an individual, an organization, or another group of people. Referential delusions is the belief that certain gestures, comments, and environmental cues are directed at oneself. So certain things that are happening around you in the environment or um, gestures that people make are directed at you. Um, somatic delusions are preoccupations regarding health and organ functions. Grandiose delusions um, is when an individual believes that he or she has exceptional abilities, wealth, or fame, and really they do not. Um, Erotomanic delusions is when an individual believes falsely that another person is in love with him or her. Nihilistic delusions is the conviction that a major catastrophe will occur. And then bizarre delusions um, delusions are deemed bizarre if they are clearly implausible and not understandable to same culture peers and do not derive from ordinary life experiences. So an example of a bizarre delusion is the belief that an outside force has removed his or her body's internal organs and replaced them with someone else's organs without leaving any marks or scars. So that would be an example of a bizarre delusion. A hallucination is a perception-like experience that occur without external stimuli. Um, so hallucinations are vivid and clear, and they come on with full force and impact of normal perceptions and not under voluntary control. And um, they can involve any sensory modality. So when we talk about schizophrenia, audio hallucinations will be the most common. Um, hallucinations must occur in the context of a clear sensorium, which means that um, those that occur while falling asleep or waking up are considered to be within the range of normal experiences. And hallucinations may also be a normal part of religion in some cultures, so that's really important to kind of tease out when you see your clients. Um, but in terms of bipolar disorder, we're going to be talking a little bit about delusions. So to start, um, I just wanted to talk about some causal factors of bipolar disorder. Scientists are studying um, the possible causes of bipolar disorder all the time, and most scientists agree that there is no single cause, but there are many factors that likely act together to produce the illness or increase risk. So two of the factors um, that I wanted to talk about with you are genetics and brain, structu brain structure and functioning. So um, in terms of genetics, bipolar disorder tends to run in families. Some research has suggested that people with certain genes are more likely to develop bipolar disorder than others. Children with a parent or a sibling who has bipolar disorder is much more likely to develop the illness compared with children who do not have a family history of bipolar disorder. However, most children with a family history of bipolar disorder will not develop the, the illness. So it's just kind of this, um, you know, this elevated risk factor, but it does not mean that you will develop it. Technological advances are improving genetic research on bipolar disorder. 
One example is the launch of the bipolar disorder phenom database, which was funded by the National Institute of Mental Health. So using this database, scientists will be able to link visible signs of the disorder with the genes that may influence them. So very cool. Um, scientists are also studying illnesses with similar symptoms, such as depression and schizophrenia, to identify genetic differences that may increase a person's risk for developing bipolar disorder. Finding these genetic hotspots, as they're calling them, may also ex help explain how environmental factors can increase a person's risk. But genes are not the only risk factor for bipolar disorder. Um, studies of identical twins have shown that the twin of a person with bipolar illness does not always develop the disorder, despite the fact that identical twins share all of the same genes. Research suggests that factors besides genes are also at work. It is likely that many different genes and environmental factors are involved. However, scientists do not yet fully understand how these factors interact to cause bipolar disorder. So in terms of the brain structure and functioning, um, brain imaging tools such as um, MRI and PET scans allow researchers to take pictures of the living brain at work, and these tools help scientists study the brain structure and activity. Some imaging studies show how the brains of people with bipolar disorder may differ from the brains of healthy people or people with other mental disorders. For example, one study using MRI found that the pattern of brain development in children with bipolar disorder was similar to that in children with multidimensional impairment, a disorder that causes symptoms that overlap somewhat with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. This suggests that the common pattern of brain development may be linked to general risk for unstable moods. And then in another MRI study, they found that the brain's prefrontal cortex in adults with bipolar disorder tends to be smaller and function less well compared to adults who don't have bipolar disorder. The prefrontal cortex, um, if you remember, is the brain structure involved in executive functions, such as solving problems and making decisions. This structure and its connections to other parts of the brain mature during adolescence, suggesting that abnormal development of this brain circuit may account for why the disorder tends to emerge during a person's teen years. Pinpointing brain changes in youth may help us detect early, um, may help us detect illness early or offer targets for early intervention, which is really important. Um, the connections between brain regions are important for shaping and coordinating functions, functions such as forming memories, learning, and emotions, but scientists know little about how different parts of the human brain connect. Learning more about these connections, along with information gained from genetic studies, helps scientists to better understand bipolar disorder. So scientists are definitely working towards being able to predict which types of treatment will work most effectively. So here is the diagnostic criteria for bipolar one disorder. Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna go through this with you. Um, for a diagnosis of bipolar one disorder, it's necessary to meet the following criteria for a manic episode. The manic episode may have been preceded by and may be followed by hypomanic or a major depressive episode, and we're going to talk about those two in a minute. So here is the criteria for a manic episode. It's a distinct period of abnormally and persistently elevated, expansive, or irritable mood, an abnormally or persistently increased goal-directed activity or energy, lasting at least one week, there's a duration, and present for most of the day nearly every day, or any duration if hospitalization is necessary. Criteria B, during the period of mood disturbance and increased energy or activity, three or more of the following symptoms are present to a significant degree and represent a noticeable change from usual behavior. So that's really important too. Like this is not how the person usually acts. So you need um, three or more of these, and four if the mood is only irritable. So inflated self-esteem or grandiosity, the decreased need for sleep. So um, typically, if the client feels rested after only three hours of sleep, then that, that would be um, a marker for that criteria. More talkative than usual or pressure to keep talking. Flight of ideas or subjective experience that thoughts are racing. So if the client's speech is really pressured, if um, the thoughts are all over the place, kind of this loose thinking, that stuff just isn't connecting. Um, distractibility as reported or observed. Increase in goal 
directed activity, either socially, at work, or sexually, or psychomotor agitation, um, so purposeless, non-goal-directed activity. And then excessive involvement in activities that have a high potential for painful consequences. So that's stuff like engaging in unrestrained buying sprees, like shop, and, shop till you drop kind of stuff, sexual indiscretions, or foolish business investment. Um, the mood disturbance is sufficiently severe to cause marked impair impairment in social or occupational functioning or to necessitate hospitalization to prevent harm to self or others, or there are psychotic features. Um, so psychotic features would be those delusions or hallucinations. And this criterion C is important because this is what's going to differentiate a manic episode from a hypomanic episode. So remember, if it's manic, it's causing severe impairment in social occupational fun functioning or um, the person needs to be hospitalized. And then, um, of course, the episode is not attributable to the psychological effects of a substance or another medical condition. Um, criterion A through D constitute a manic episode. At least one lifetime manic episode is required for the diagnosis of bipolar. So this is a hypomanic episode, which is, it kind of looks the same as a manic episode, but um, scaled down a little bit. So, so you still need three or more of the same symptoms, four if the mood is irritable, so that inflated self-esteem, decreased need for sleep, more talkative than usual, flight of ideas, distractibility, and increased in goal-directed activity. Um, criterion C, the episode is associated with an unequivocal change in functioning that is uncharacteristic of the individual when not symptomatic, so something's going on. Um, the disturbance in mood and the change in functioning are observable by others. However, here's the difference. The episode is not severe enough to cause marked impairment in social or occupational functioning or to necessitate hospitalization. Again, if there are psychotic features, hallucinations, or delusions, then the episode by definition is manic. So this really has a lot to do with clinical judgment, has a lot to do with knowing your client and listening to what they're saying and being able to assess if they are a harm to themselves or a harm to others in terms of deeming it a manic episode or a hypomanic episode. Um, and then as always, the episode is not attributable to the psychological effects of a substance. And then there's a note in the DSM, criterion A through F constitute a hypomanic episode. Um, they're common in bipolar 1 disorder but are not required for the diagnosis of bipolar 1 disorder. So you do not have to have a hypomanic episode, but you do have to have a manic episode, which alternates with your major depressive episode. So it's kind of like the client is up and then the client is down and the client is up and then the client is down. Um, so for the major depressive episode, five or more of the following symptoms have been present during the same two-week period and represent a change from previous functioning. And just like major depressive disorder, at least one of the symptoms is either depressed mood or anhedonia, which if you remember is the loss of interest or pleasure in things that you used to find fun. Um, so depressed mood most of the day, nearly every day. These are going to look really familiar to you because we just went over depression. Marked, markedly diminished interest and pleasure in all or almost all activities most of the day, nearly every single day. Significant weight loss when not dieting or weight gain. So um, the criteria is a change of more than 5% of body weight in a month. Or a decrease or increase in appetite nearly every single day. Insomnia or hypersomnia nearly every day. So I can't sleep or I want to sleep all the time. Psychomotor, psychomotor agitation or retardation nearly every day. Um, and this needs to be observable by others. It, it can't just be a subjective claim by your client. Fatigue or loss of energy nearly every day. Feelings of worthlessness or excessive or inappropriate guilt. Here's that delusion again. Um, nearly every day. Diminished ability to think or concentrate or indecisiveness nearly every day. And then recurrent thoughts of death, recurrent suicidal ideation without a plan, or a suicide attempt, or a specific plan for committing suicide. So just like in a major depressive disorder episode, um, the criterion are pretty much the same. 
the symptoms cause clinically significant distress and impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. And of course, they're not attributable to the physiological effects of a substance or another medical condition. So continuing with the major depressive episode, criteria A through C constitute a major depressive episode. Those are all those symptoms we just talked about. Um, they are common in bipolar 1 disorder, but they are not required for the diagnosis of bipolar 1 disorder. And if you look down under bipolar 1 disorder A, um, what is what is required is the criteria have been met for at least one manic episode. So you have to have the manic episode in order to have the diagnosis of bipolar 1. Um, there's also a note in the DSM-5 under bipolar about bereavement. Um, and that's the second note up at the top. So responses to significant loss may include the same feelings that we talked about when we talked about major depressive disorder and the same feelings that I just went over for the criterion for a major depressive episode. So it's really important um, to use your clinical judgment and to really understand the individual's history and the culture that your client is coming from in order to um, decide if their bereavement is normal. If, if, if this major depressive episode is in response to a significant loss. So bipolar 1 disorder epidemiology. Um, the prevalence, the lifetime prevalence is 0.6% in the U.S. So um, it's, it's, it's a small number. The gender, male to female, it looks pretty equal. It's one to one. The mean age of onset is 18 years for the first manic, hypomanic, or major depressive episode. So those of you who are working in college counseling centers, this is definitely something that's prevalent and something to look out for. Um, but onset can occur at any stage throughout the life cycle. More than 90% of individuals that have had a single manic episode go on to have recurrent mood episodes. And then 60% of manic episodes occur immediately before a major depressive episode. So typically, um, you know, in more than half of, of the population who have bipolar 1 disorder, the manic episode comes first. And then the comorbidity, um, very high with anxiety disorders. That's the most common. Definitely comorbid with ADHD and um, conduct disorder, which we're going to talk about in a couple weeks. And then substance use disorders. Some risk factors um, for bipolar 1 disorder. So environmental factors, I thought this was interesting. It's more common in high-income than low-income countries, almost twice as common in high-income countries. So um, here's your first question. Why do you think that that is? Take a moment to kind of jot down some ideas that you have about that. And then also there's higher rates among separated, divorced, or widowed individuals as compared to um, people that are married. So maybe write down why you think that is too. I also thought that was a very interesting fact. Some genetic factors, family history is the strongest and most consistent risk factors. Um, in fact, there's a tenfold increased risk among adult relatives of individuals with bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 disorders. And the closer you are to the relative, the higher your risk. So it's, if it's your parent, the greater your risk than if it's your grandparent or your great-grandparent. But remember, that doesn't mean that you are going to have it. It just means that um, you might have a higher predisposition to um, acquiring it. Um, suicide risk. Suicide is really important to assess for whenever you have a client that presents with bipolar disorder. The lifetime risk of suicide is estimated to be at least 15 times that of the general population. So that's a huge implication for mental health counselors to be aware of. Um, bipolar may account for one quarter of all completed suicides. That's a big number. And then the risk um, increases with past history of attempt and the length of the depressive episodes. So the longer the depressive episodes and the more time you've attempted a suicide, your risk for completion is greater. So bipolar 2 disorder, the diagnostic criteria, um, it is necessary to meet the following criteria for a hypomanic episode. Um, so the criteria is the same as it was for bipolar 1 for this hypomanic episode. 
So a distinct period of abnormally and persistently elevated, expansive, or irritable mood, which is different from how the individual um, typically acts, and your dur duration is lasting at least four consecutive days, so four days in a row, and present most of the day nearly every day. And then during the period of this mood disturbance and increased energy and activity, three or more of the symptoms have persisted, which is, again, a notice noticeable change in behavior. So same symptoms, increased or inflated self-esteem, um, decreased need for sleep, more talkative than usual or pressure to keep talking, flight of ideas, distractibility, increase in goal-directed activity, excessive involvement in activities that have a high potential for painful consequences. Um, and so the episode is associated with an unequivocal change in functioning, so it's not characteristic of the individual. Um, it's observable by others. And here's the really important part. It's not severe enough to cause marked impairment in social or occupational functioning or to necessitate hospitalization. So it's a degree lower than a manic episode. And then um, the major depressive episode also has to be present, and those criteria are exactly the same as the criteria in bipolar 1 that we discussed a couple minutes ago. So in order to be diagnosed with bipolar 2 disorder, criteria has been met for at least one hypomanic episode and at least one major depressive episode. So you need both, um, which was different from bipolar 1 disorder. Um, and in bipolar 2 disorder, there has never been a manic episode. So it's that manic episode that's really differentiating between the bipolar 1 and the bipolar 2. And again, determining if the episode is manic or hypomanic is going to be based on your clinical judgment. It's going to be based on the client's um, history and on the client's culture. Um, it's not better explained by schizoaffective disorder, schizophrenia, schizophreniform disorder, delusional disorder. We're going to talk about all of those in a couple of weeks. And then the symptoms of depression or the unpredictability caused by frequent alternation between periods of depression and hypomania causes clinically significant distress. So um, the distress is coming from the depression or coming from the frequent alteration because your moods are all over the place because the client's moods are up and down. Here's the epidemiology of bipolar 2. So the prevalence, the 12-month prevalence, is 0.3% internationally and 0.8% in the U.S. Um, this was interesting. The DSM-4 criteria for bipolar 1, bipolar 2, and bipolar NOS stands for not otherwise specified, com had a combined rate of 1.8% in the U.S., but 2.7% in youths 12 years or older. Again, average age of, on, average age of onset, mid-20s. And then 5 to 15% of individuals with bipolar 2 disorder have multiple mood episodes within the previous 12 months. In gender, it's more common in females. And I thought that this was interesting. It says that childbirth may be a specific trigger for a hypomanic episode. In fact, 10 to 20% of females in their early postpartum periods may have a hypomanic episode. So here's another um, opportunity to write down why you think that is. What do you think is going on that makes that happen? And then in terms of comorbidity, um, again, anxiety disorders are the most common. And then this is a big number, too. 60% of individuals with bipolar 2 have at least three or more co-occurring disorders. That's a lot of disorders for one person. Um, substance abuse disorders are very common, and also binge eating disorder, which I thought was interesting, too. And then the last disorder we are going to talk about in the bipolar family is the cyclothymic disorder. So here's the diagnostic criteria. So for at least two years, um, one year in children and adolescents, there have been numerous periods with hypomanic symptoms that do not meet the criteria for a hypomanic episode, and numerous periods with depressive symptoms that do not meet criteria for a depressive episode. So what does that look like? That looks like instead of three or more of the hypomanic symptoms being present, there's only two present. Or instead of five symptoms for depression, there's only three present. 
So something is definitely going on, but you're just not meeting the full criteria for, for those two, for hypomanic and major depressive episode. Um, B, during the above two-year period, the hypomanic and depressive periods have been present for at least half the time, and the individual has not been without the symptoms for more than two months at a time. So duration is really important to look at for cyclothymic disorder. Um, criteria, like we said, for a major depressive episode, a manic episode, or a hypomanic episode have never been met. So you're, you're just, you, you've got the symptoms, client has the symptoms, but just not all of them to make the criteria. They're not better explained by a different disorder, and they're not attributable to a substance abuse or a medical condition, but they do cause clinically significant distress and impairment in social, occupational, and other important areas of functioning. So here's the epidemiology for cyclothymic disorder. The prevalence rate is 0.4% to 1% in the lifetime prevalence. Um, in mood disorder clinics, it ranges from 3% to 5%. So those are people that are um, actually in treatment for mood disorders. So uh, it makes sense that it is a little bit higher. The age of onset, um, adolescence or early adult life, the onset is insidious and the, pers the course is persistent. 15% to 30% chance that an individual with cyclothymic disorder will develop bipolar disorder at some point. So that's a pretty... It's a pretty daunting number, too. Um, again, comorbidity with substance-related disorders, sleep disorders, and ADHD in children. So let's talk a little bit about treatment. Um, the first line of defense for bipolar disorder is medication, again, and combined with therapy. So I did want to go over um, three types of medication that are commonly prescribed for bipolar disorder, um, mood stabilizers, antipsychotics, and antidepressants. So different types of medications can help control the symptoms of bipolar disorder, but not everyone will respond to medications in the same way. Clients will typically need to try several different medications before finding the one that works best for them. Um, something that you can do with your clients is help them to keep a daily life chart that makes notes of their um, daily mood symptoms, treatments, sleep, sleep patterns, and life events that can help your client um, and your client's doctor to track and treat their illness more effectively. If symptoms change or if your client tells you that symptoms change or your client tells you that they're experiencing side effects that become intolerable, um, it's important for them to go back to their doctor to talk about that. Um, so, like I said, the types of medication generally, generally used to treat bipolar disorder include mood stabilizers, um, antipsychotics, and antidepressants. Let's see. So, mood stabilizers are usually the first choice to treat bipolar disorder. In general, people with bipolar disorder continue treatment with mood stabilizers for years. An example of a mood stabilizer is lithium. Um, it was the first mood stabilizer approved by the FDA in the 1970s for treating both manic and depressive episodes. Um, Anticonvulsants are also used as mood stabilizers. They were originally developed to treat seizures, but they also help control moods. Um, Anticonvulsant medications have an FDA warning. The warning states that their use may increase the risk of suicidal thoughts and behaviors. So really important to know what kind of meds that your client is on, especially if they do have those increased thoughts, because then you need to be talking to the doctor. Um, people taking anticonvulsant medications for bipolar or other illnesses should be monitored closely for newer worsening symptoms of depression, suicidal thoughts or behavior, or any unusual changes in mood or behavior. Clients should never make any changes to their dosages. You should never, ever, in a million years, make any change to their dosage. Um, send the client right back to their doctor. There's lots of side effects with mood stabilizers. So this might be where um, the daily life chart that your client makes and shares with you might be helpful. So um, lithium can cause side effects such as restlessness, dry mouth, bloating and indigestion, acne, Unusual discomfort to cold temperatures, joint or muscle pain, or brittle nails and hair. And when clients take lithium, their doctor should be checking their levels of lithium in their blood regularly, and they will monitor their kidney and thyroid functions as well. So lots of blood tests. Um, let's see. Because 
Oh, so lithium can um, cause low thyroid levels in some people, especially women. So because too much or too little thyroid hormone can lead to mood and energy changes, it's important that doctors also check clients' thyroid levels carefully. You want to make sure that um, whatever your client is experiencing is not attributed to the side effects of their medication. So let's see, common side effects of other mood stabilizing medications include drowsiness, dizziness, headache, diarrhea, constipation, heartburn, mood swings, stuffed or runny nose, and other cold-like or flu symptoms. Um, these medications may also be linked with rare but serious side effects. Um, so if your clients report any extremely bothersome or unusual side effects, they need to tell their doctor as soon as possible, and you need to call the doctor and tell them as well. Then there's antipsychotics. So atypical antipsychotics are sometimes used to treat symptoms of bipolar disorder. Often these medications are taken with other medications, such as antidepressants. Um, side effects of antipsychotics include drowsiness, dizziness with changing positions, blurred vision, rapid heartbeat, sensitivity to the sun, skin rashes, and menstrual problems for women. Typically, you should not drive if you're taking an antipsychotic until you're totally adjusted to it. These are like heavy-duty meds. Um, they could also cause major weight gain and changes in metabolism. They could increase risk of getting diabetes and high cholesterol. Um, so doctors monitor clients' weight, glucose levels, and lipid levels when they're taking these meds. Also, in rare cases, long-term use of atypical antipsychotic drugs may lead to a condition called tardive dyskinesia, TD for short. Um, the condition causes uncontrollable muscle movements frequently around the mouth. TD can range from mild to severe. And then some people with TD recover partially or fully after they stop taking the drug, but others do not. So big side effects. Um, antidepressants are sometimes used to treat symptoms of depression and bipolar. Um, things like Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Wellbutrin might be prescribed. Um, but however, taking only an antidepressant can increase a client's risk of switching to mania or hypomania because you're only treating one side of the bipolar disorder, or of developing rapid cycling symptoms, which we're going to talk about in class. Um, and then if you have clients that are pregnant um, that have bipolar disorder, they definitely face special challenges. So mood-stabilizing medications could harm a developing fetus or a nursing infant, but stopping meds either suddenly or gradually greatly increases the risk that bipolar symptoms will reoccur during pregnancy. So um, lithium is generally the preferred mood-stabilizing medication for pregnant women with bipolar disorder, but it can lead to heart problems in the fetus. So double-edged sword there. Stay on the meds or not stay on the meds or is the med going to harm the fetus? Just a lot of things to be aware of if you're working with a client that is pregnant and um, has a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. So in terms of therapy, um, the go-to is CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, which helps people with bipolar disorder learn to change harmful or negative thought patterns and behaviors. Interpersonal psychotherapy helps people um, improve their relationships with others and manage their daily routines. Regular daily routines and sleep schedules may help protect against manic episodes, so very important. Family therapy um, helps enhance the family's coping strategies, such as recognizing new episodes early and helping their loved one. It also improves communication among family members as well as problem solving. And of course, psychoeducation um, you know, especially with your clients with bipolar disorder, teach them about the illness, teach them about the treatment every step of the way. Um, it can also help to, you can also help clients to recognize signs of an impending mood swing so they can seek treatment early before a full-blown episode occurs. Um, Psychoed is really good to do in a group and it's great to do for family members and caregivers. So I asked you to write down, um, I believe it was three things, so I'll put that up in the reminder section to um, just jot down your answers to those three questions, and then we will go um, much more in-depth with lots of video examples um, into bipolar in class. Thanks.